Okay, we're looking at the uh, now with our second session of uh, going through the sources that seem to suggest that we're talking about tzniut in uh, in the Tanakh, and that is the last source that I have that I wanted to look at from Tanakh, and this is from Tehillim chapter Mem- Memtet chapter sorry chapter forty five. Um, um, here, this is this is the the verse that we want to look at. Kol kevuda, bat melech penima mi mishbetzot zahav levusha. Here, kol kevuda. Here. Uh, so the way this verse is translated usually is that the the glory of the princess should be inside, but we really need to read this more from from beginning to end to understand the context of what is happening here, and also see the the problem in the text. Uh, it starts beautifully as a praise for the king. Uh, this is what we call the superscript, the introduction to the song that tells us how who wrote the, the uh, who wrote the song Livne Kora, how to sing it. Um uh, is probably the, the choir master, the leader. Shoshanim uh, could be a certain type of musical instrument. Uh Shirya Didot is a song of praise, a love song. What is Maskil? Maskil is uh, a wise person. Yeah. And there are commentators that suggest that whenever we find the word maskil in the superscript of, te, of a tehillim, of a song, it says that there is a, uh, an encoded message in the text. So you have to be maskil, you have to understand that. And as we see, really, the, the, uh, this psalm is, uh, um, starts as a, as a song of praise, but becomes sort of sarcastic, it's a satire. Um, and here it's we, not really, it's, it's not really 49 though, right? Is it? It's 40, it's 40, hey, 45 a second. Is it not with me? Uh, it says 45 here. Yeah, it's 45. Okay. Yeah, 49 is the one that we read, 49 is, uh, also Maskil is the one that we read at the Beta Avel. Um, okay. yeah. Um, I'm just following with the Tanakh, so I had to find yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, it's 45. 49 on the and then this uh, Korach is the one that we do before Kiyat Shofar. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so we have this. Uh, what, what is the, what is the uh, author saying? My heart is astir with gracious words. I speak my, my poem to the king. My tongue uh, is the pen of an expert scribe. You are fairer than all men. Your speech is endowed with grace. Rightly has God given you an eternal blessing. Uh, gird your sword upon your thigh, O hero, in your splendor and glory. In your glory win success. Ride on in the cause of truth and meekness and right. And let your right hand lead you to awesome deeds. Uh, your arrows sharpen and pierce the breast of the king's enemies. Peoples fall at your feet. Your divine throne is everlasting. Your royal scepter is a scepter of, uh, of equity. You love righteousness uh, and hate wickedness. Rightly has God, your God, chosen to anoint you with oil of gladness over all your peers. That is when the praise ends. I mean, maybe this is where we, we find uh, the shift. Because up, until this, up until this point in the Mizmo, it is perfect. It, it describes the king as someone who, who speaks clearly, who is a leader, uh, a military leader, but also a judge. He is uh, he is graced with the, with humility. Um, he defeats his enemies. His throne is established by God. He loves justice. He uh, he hates wickedness, and that's why he was anointed. That's verse eight. But after first eight, verse eight, the uh, the 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 Shemen Amishha with which is anointed as a king changes sharply into this. Uh, I'm really going to read it in Hebrew. Mor v'ahalot ketziot kol bigdotecha minichlei shen mini simbehucha. All your robes are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. 
from ivory to palaces, lutes entertain you. Beautiful. Now, the king, who was described up until this point as a spiritual and uh, military leader, now becomes someone who is uh, dressed in fragrant robes. But, okay, that's not so bad, still. But interesting to, to know that the word in Hebrew, not called begadecha, all your garments should have been called begadecha. It says it's called bigdotecha. That is a stronger allusion to the nature of begad that I mentioned before, which is uh, uh, treason. treason. To betray. Or to betray, right. So the king here, uh, we already hear something that uh, the king is a traitor. The king is not, and if we know the, the history of Melachim, even in Sefer Shemuel, we know that the, even the, the most righteous kings went awry. So what happens next? In verse 10, Benot Melachim bikerotecha, nitzeva shegal limincha bechetem ofir. Royal princesses are your favorites. The concert stands at your right hand, decked in gold of Ophir. So if the word princesses is, can still be understood as a positive word, but the word, the next word, Shegal, the concert or the mistress, is a terrible word. It, <coughs> it is so terrible that we don't read it. We don't read it. Yeah. When you have the few, the few occurrences that you have of the, uh, the root Shin Gimel Lamed yeah. in the Torah, you don't read Shagal, but rather Shachav. Uh, in the Klalot, in the Varim, it says, Isha Te'ares, Ve'ish Aher Yish Kavena. You will betroth a woman, and someone else would sleep with her. But the, the, the written text is Yish Gelena. We don't read it. We say Yish Kavena. It's too horrible to read. Also in Zechariah, in uh, the description of sort of the Armageddon, the, the, the battle at the end of days, it says, Bayom Ahu, and the women we violated, the word is Tishagarna, we read instead Tishachavna. So, for the, for the author of Tehillim to say that the Shegal, that woman who is a, of, of dubious uh, uh, qualities, stands next to the king, to the right deck in gold of Ophir, meaning she comes from a, maybe from a foreign country, is a sharp rebuke criticism of the king and of his behavior, his living the life of the of a corrupt king. This is not praise to the king. It's criticism. Yes. I thought of, of fears about like a sapphire or no? Is that, was no, that a different word? No, that's sapir. Sapir, oh. yeah. Uh, no, no. That's, that's how it's translated. Now I'm jumping in into an open door. Why does it exactly mean that is exactly, uh, I mean, what Aaron just mentioned, that the, in some ways it's read for, for Hatan. Uh, yes, because the, it, it speaks like we talk about the women are being brought to the palace, so it's, there is a certain similarity. But when you dig into the Mizmur, into the Psalm, you realize that's not the kind of thing that you would want to write, read at a wedding. And also that when, uh, when we speak about modesty, this is definitely not the source to argue for modesty. Again, you have to feel Adam. Yeah, that's the right, right, right. But then, like I said, from verse uh, that's up to verse eight, and then the shift, um, and as actually, it's sort of balanced because of the sixteen verses at the beginning of the of the psalm, eight are praise, and another eight are. Uh, Criticism, and then the last two are ambiguous. So there are a they are clearly in favor of the king. Eight are clearly against the king, and the last two, the the author leaves it. It's up to you to decide what is what is exactly uh, going on here. So um, I'm looking now at verse ten. So we read that. That's on top of page two. Uh, the inverse Yud Aleph, Shimri Bat, or Eva Tios Nech, Veshikhe Amech Obet Avich, listen, O daughter or girl, and see and pay heed and forget your nation and the house of your father. So those women are being brought 
the, whoever girl, this girl, the, the princess, is being brought from a foreign country to, of all the kings that we know in Tanakh, to whom this description is most uh, fitting, Shlomo. Shlomo, where the, uh, probably an exaggeration, had 700 uh, wives, uh, sorry, 300 wives and 700 concubines or mistresses, and the Navi clearly says, Vayi le'et ziknato nashav yituet levavo. At an old age, his, his wives caused him to deviate. And it says that his wives were worshipping idols, mekatot, mezabhot, that they would uh, yeah. bring sacrifices and incense to their, to their idols. Uh, the rabbis tried to sort of uh, save, uh, you know, save, save grace for Shulamo, saying that God forbid he himself did not deviate, but he did not rebuke his wives, so it wasn't uh, uh, exactly, uh, it was considered as if he had done that, uh, but uh, we see that immediately after the death of Shulamo, the kingdom split, so something didn't go right. And that could be very well a rebuke, again, that is leveled against Shulamo, or if not against Shulamo, against one of his descendants, that, but it is dis- disguised in the way of, of a praise to the king. Um, maybe just because of, uh, you know, safety reasons. It's not, it's, it is, the, the prophet who rebukes people is not welcome. We know that from Yirmiyahu, who has been thrown to jail, they tried to kill him. We know it from uh, um, Amos, who was told, Jose Lechabra, f- you know, flee the city, run away before the king kills you. It's not, uh, uh, it's a dangerous pr- uh, profession you know, to rebuke to rebuke the the ruler. You don't want to do that. But Rabbi, if if you take really um, some of the psukim here, it's very clearly Hatan I mean, uh, Of course, it's Hatan Vekala. The this, king, this. right? It is a bride and groom, but the king is the the king is the groom. <laughs> yeah, okay. of course. But, but the problem is. Yeah. Right, I agree. It, yes, 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 yes. But no, it's not halacha. That's the, exactly the point. I want you to hear in the first session. We we're saying that those verses that people use as a basis for halacha, the halacha is really not there. Why it's not there? Because if you really want, when when you see your son or daughter getting married, you don't want that to happen. The the, the nice part is yes, but the, the full story no. Because what happens next is this. Shimibatui. Now, the the king already has, benot melachim bikirotecha. He has the daughters of kings. He has the 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 consort. He doesn't the the next the other woman who's going to come, she's not going to be his only. You know, I'm for my beloved, and my beloved is for me, right? It's king. It's Shlomo Melech. He has a thousand wives. So he has a, there's a wall in the palace where we have. Wife of the week, or maybe wife of the day, or of the hour, right? You don't even know uh, uh, what that is. Shira Shirim is also, by the way, a very strong re- rebuke against Shlomo. It is, yeah, read it carefully, and you realize it's not, it's not very supportive of Shlomo. And that's also the way the Malbim, uh, that is commentary. Wait, wait a second. We get to, yes. If that's the way, basically, they're saying uh, anti kingship. They really don't want, they're really telling Jews not to have kings. Right. At the end, uh, at the end, when you finish reading the Torah and the Vimic to you realize that it, the, you know, it's good to be the king, but it's not good for us to have a king. Uh, so then you ask, why are we praying for the for the return of the king? That's we we pray we pray for what we know. We don't know exactly how it will be, but that's that's another issue. I want to get back one second to this pasuk because this is really the the, the core. Like I said, three psukim Torah Vim Ktuvim. This is the core pasuk from Ktuvim that so many halachot rely on, arguing that a woman should be indoors, and even we'll see Rambam later on uh, uses this pasuk. A woman should not be seen outside, should not be driving, should not be uh, should not be holding a public office. Why is that? Uh, they they now are encouraging the woman to come in. Come, why? Verse twelve: The king will desire your beauty. He will be your lord and bow to him. The woman is subservient. And the king is the all the king wants is a beautiful woman. And what next? Usually, it is translated all the glory in the halacha, 
all the kavod of the princess is to be inside. But that's not what it means. It's not what it says. If that was the case, it should have been kol kevoda, but melech prima. Kol kevoda is the way actually we use it in modern Hebrew. Kevoda is luggage. <laughs> is the, the heavy stuff that she brings with her. The trunks is, you know, yalla, kol kevoda. The, a, new, a new delivery, a new shipment has come. A new princess. Bring her in with all the kevoda. Oh, this one is decked in gold. Mishbetzot al levusha. And how do, we, how do I know that she's not the only one? Not only because of verse 10 where he speaks about the princesses, because right after that, Lirkamot tuval la melech, betulot ahareha, reoteha, muvaot lach. Her companions are being uh, presented to the king. Tuval na bizvachot magil tavona becha melech. So it's an endless uh, flow. charade flow of women coming to... Yeah. That's not the ideal king. That's not whom you want. So first half... Second half of the Mizmo. How does it conclude? Tahat avotecha yu banecha teshitemo lesarim bechol aaretz. Your sons will succeed your ancestor. You will appoint them princes throughout the land. That when I said this is ambiguous because it seems like praise. Oh, you wonderful king! Your your many children from your many wives will become princes and will rule over the land. Not very promising for the people, but it's the the opposite of verse 8. In verse 8, it says, uh, sorry, 7 and 8, Kis'acha Elohim olam va'ed, Shevet mishor Shevet malchutecha. God has established your throne forever because you judge mishor in righteousness. That is David, or the promise to David, right? Tahat, uh, uh, no, this is Tahat Avotecha. Le David nishba Hashem, Hashem swore to David that he will always have a descendant as a king. Promise that depends on David's behavior, has to act with righteousness, with uh, uh, with honesty. But here, and then uh, God will anoint him. But verse 17 says, you, not God, you will appoint your children as princes. And the, I think that's the height of sarcasm because this is a, 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 ver, a phrase that is reserved only for God. When you say, I will, I will right? We, we, only, we only say it about God. So he's telling the king, you brought yourself, you have elevated yourself to the level of demigod or God, which is the same thing that the prophet Yehezkel says to uh, the king of Avel, Ech alita la shamayim helel ben shahar. This is another prophecy. So, uh, conclusion, so far like or it's a sub-conclusion. We went through uh, the verses in Tanakh that are used by halachic literature to argue for modesty is halacha. And the three main verses are in the Barim, chapter 23, um in uh, Micha chapter 6 verse 8 and in Tehillim chapter 45 verse 14 none of them is related to modesty uh, the verse you know, Tehillim is actually uh, a rebuke about promiscuity and a corrupt lifestyle uh, Micha is about being uh, modest in the way we uh, Project our religiosity, and Devarim uh, Kadosh is about body hygiene and uh, human dignity, and all the other sources in Tanakh. There's not one source that could clearly show us that there is a requirement for a person, whether man or woman, to dress with modesty. So we've seen the the biblical sources and. Um, the important thing is really to uh, to ask this question: Where is the biblical codex that speaks about uh, about modesty? Even like, give me one verse that is written as a commandment or written as a as an imperative. You have yes, basar behalav, right? We know that what we do today with basar behalav is not what's written in the Torah, but at least the Torah says. Lot of Hashem geti b'halevimo, right? Yeah, right? We know that our Lela Seder is not what's written in the Torah, but the Torah says v'igadet adem in chabayom ahu, and so on and so forth. We don't like Melachot Shabbat. 
kept evolving. You know, some people on Shabbat, they feel like they're in a minefield. They'd rather take, you know, uh, I spoke with a friend of mine who's a doctor. And I said, you know, we could do, we have a good business, offer anesthesia for Shabbat. Hmm. This way, you know, you're not going to break Shabbat. And I know, I know some people will take it. He says, the people I know, they would want anesthesia for life just to not to, not to transgress any mitzvah. But for all these people, at least there's some kind of, of a source in the Torah. It says, Lot Shabbat, Nothing about it's new. That, that's telling. So now, uh, since I'm going, I'm trying to go uh, chronologically according to the development of, of the, uh, the uh, Torah Shabbat Alpeh, so, I know a lot of people would place after the Torah, they place the Mishnah and then Midrash Halacha because of the names or um, or uh, uh, the concept that we have about its editing. But it, in reality, the first form of the, in which way in which people studied the uh, uh, Torah was through Midrash Halacha because Midrash Halacha analyzes the Pesukim and derives. Conclusions, but here, here is the one midrash halacha, and the other two sections I I took from midrash agada, that uh, when speaking about chronology is much much later because it's bamidbar rabba from the twelfth, probably even from the twelfth century, so sort of a, a quantum leap in time. But because people see it as uh, as uh, um, Rabbinic literature, I put Midrash, Halacha, and Agadah together. He has done. Just if you say starting at 12, 11, 1200s, that's when they started making Jews wear separate clothes from them. So that might uh, have influence on, give or take, depending where they were. This the, it, it goes, I mean, it's a 12th century compilation, but goes from to, to earlier times, some of that. But yes, definitely we could say that the, uh, you know, those are, those are, um, uh, crucial uh, years in the formation of Jewish theology up to the 12th century. From the 9th, we could say from 8th or 9th century to the 12th century, this is where the divide happens within uh, the Jewish nation between sort of the Sephardim and the Ashkenazim or the, you know, some Italian and Eretz Israel. And in, in large uh, part it was because one community lived under the rule of Islam, and another community lived under the rule of Christianity. Christianity. And definitely there was a deep effect of, of, because had, of that. Had to wear certain thing, certain the way they dressed, the way they interacted with, 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 their, with their surroundings, and so on. Uh, so let's, let's look at this Midrash, uh, Midrash Halakha. I think that's, Midrash, that's a interpretation of the halakhic part of the Torah. And it speaks about this famous pasuk that we mentioned before, Ufara et Rosh Aisha. Um, he will be porea, the head of the woman. So is it unbind or uncover? So the midrash says, "Kohen nifna la porea uforea kedei lekayem ba mitzvat priya divrei Rabbi Ishmael." That and according to Rabbi Ishmael, it, it says, "Kohen nifna la porea." The kohen turns uh, to the back. Of the woman behind her to perform this act. It's not clear what 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 does it actually mean that nifna la horea. It is a possibility. I don't want to get uh, all the details of that. It is there is a possibility that uh, the kohen would stand behind the woman and she does not face the people, so they would not see her. So he sort of uh, hides her from the people because the next opinion in the midrash is that of Rabbi Yohanan ben Beroka. It says that you have to, to actually put a, a, a sheet or some kind of fabric to hide her from the people. But the, the other rabbis reject his opinion. They say she didn't care about her behavior. We don't care if she becomes uh, publicly uh, uh, disgraced. And then we have this davar aher limed al benot Yisrael shen mechasot rashehen ve'af al pishen re'ayal davar. Another interpretation, uh, we learn that the daughters of Israel cover their heads, lest a man will see them. Uh, and even though, uh, even though we don't have a proof, there is a zecher. Uh, zecher is sort of, uh, um, I would say, like a support or... Uh, 
a hint, it's a remez, it's a hint, an illusion, that Tamar covered her head with ashes. Um, so, uh, and then, so we'll go back to that. Finally, Rabbi Yudah Omer, if it was a Halitzah, it wouldn't have been a Megaleu, and if it was a Seara, it wouldn't have been a Sotro. Bet Halitzah means the, uh, the chest area, like Bet Halitzah, it's like what we call today Halitzah. So Rabbi Yudah says, should, this should not be exposed. Uh, and, but that is the important thing. If it was a Seara, it wouldn't have been a Sotro. It would not uh, uncover, uh, he would not uncover it, or he would not, it doesn't it would not uncover, he would not be soter. What is soter? To destroy, he would not unbind, uh, not unbind the hair. So we have a situation here where the woman is with, she has nice hair, and the Kohen would not unbraid it because he doesn't want her to be attractive. And that, that we have to keep in mind when, uh, until we get again to the sugya of the Gemara in Ketubot that deals with the issue of that Yehudi, the, 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 the law of Jewish women. As, as I mentioned before, that uh, in Mishnaic times at least, the idea of a woman going with loose hair was sort of a calling card for a prostitute. So that is arousing unbound hair, not uncovered, disheveled hair. The whole idea, though, with the sota is tr- to try to humiliate her. As to to make her, to, right, to get her to confess, right. Well, I mean, I mean, the idea is that you don't want to erase the God's name in, from, right. the, from the writing. I mean, that's, that's the main, the, the whole process of humiliation. Right. It's not to get to that point that you erase the name of no, God. No, it's it or, is it is. There's no question that this is a uh, um, you know we're manipulating the woman that's to right, to get right. her to confess that she did that. That's right. That probably was also uh, some uh, some kind of also pressure on the husband. The interesting to me thing to me is that uh, we don't have a statement like we have with the uh, rebellious son or Irani Dahad, the city that uh, everybody worshipped idols, that some rabbis say it never happened. Mm-hmm. But, on the other we hand... Don't, we don't know if a case that happened. Exactly. That was my point. We also don't know, and you would have thought that if they had one woman that was brought to Bedin and, and yeah, went through the process of Sata, yeah. the rabbis would have mentioned it in the Mishnah. They would definitely have said something. The fact that it is never mentioned means that it never happened. Uh, and most probably, if there were cases of men and women arguing about their relationships, most probably they would break without... Remember, there was no Ketubah at the time, at the time of the Temple, almost until the, uh, the end of the, of the Temple period... <coughs> There were no kutubot, so a man and a woman would just break apart, and that's it. There is a, a, a doctor, Bet Shalom, Dr. David Goldstein, who wrote a book, he's, uh, he's a specialist, he's a <coughs> NIH, his specialty is adrenaline. Uh-huh. And he wrote a book about it, and he mentioned this case of Sota. Oh, interesting. He I would like to look it up. Scientific, I have the book at home. Okay. His scientific explanation to everything that happened with Sota, with regard to her hair, to her, to Nafal Yerechan, everything, uh, interesting. everything that you want, he has a scientific explanation. I'd like to see that. I'll bring you the book. I'd like to see that. But the, now, but the, the, in terms of halakha, now when we go back to the Midrash halakha, because this is the source of Parah, uh, the, the addition here of the Davar Aher in Hebrew, Limed Abelot Israel Shem Mechasot Rashihen seems really uh, out of place. I tried to look at the uh, uh, at the uh, It's hard to find like the original uh, text of of Sifrei Bamidba, where there is a critical edition by Professor Menachem Kahana. But we don't know, even though we have a critical edition, whether this uh, this ver- this text was part of the original midrash. And I, I think that it was not part of the original Midrash because uh, if, if this verse of Ufara'at Rosh Aisha was understood by 
Rabbi Shemayin, by the commentator, that uh, it teaches us that a woman must cover her hair, then you should stop here. Period. It teaches us that Jewish women cover their hair. Why do you add the story with Tamar, which is which makes no sense whatsoever? And I'll get there. Uh, it seems like someone else tried to push the the uh, original argument of the uh, of the midrash that was about uh, unbinding towards uncovering. Um, and we'll see it again when we get to Ketubot. But I'll tell you what the Gemara and Ketubot says. And then we'll see it more uh, uh, in depth when we get there. Um, when uh, when the Mishnah and Ketubot says that a woman who goes out with her head parua, it doesn't say uncovered, it says parua, uh, is transgressing that Yehudit. The, the Gemara asks, but this is not that Yehudit, it's not the practice of Jewish women, it's biblical because Rabbi Shemayin said and then it quotes a completely different text from Rabbi Shemayin, and not this one. <coughs> and later on, commented a struggle with that. So th- this text is problematic. So it's problematic first in relying on a completely different verse, and not only is it a different verse, it's a verse from ne- from Nevi'im, from prophets, and also it's uh, incidental. It's not a commandment. Just like Ufarat Rosh itself doesn't say that a woman must dress in that manner, but uh, that this is what the coin does. The, what is this? What is the story? And what is the proof from uh, from the story of Tamar? Uh, one second. Right, right. So first of all, what is the story with Tamar? The, uh, to me, it's I would say beyond uh, shocking. It's so very disturbing to think. That this that someone used this pasuk as a proof for hair covering. Um, first of all, the word efer throughout Tanakh uh, means ashes and nothing else. Uh, there is one place that techasi einaich ba efer, you cover your eyes with with ashes. That people try to argue that it means that you that she cover that the efer is kind of a garment. But obviously it's not, because efer, or, or uh, coal, if it's not ashes, it's coal that was used as, as makeup. That is the meaning of the other pasuk. Uh, later in, in rabbinical language, there's an item called ma'aporet, that could also be read by someone who doesn't pronounce the difference between ayin and aleph, is ma'aporet, and that was sort of a scarf. But from the aleph peyresh in ma'aporet to a efer, there's a, there's a huge distance. Now, not only that, what is the story with Tamar? Tamar is violated by her brother, Amnon. And after she's violated, she asks him, please let me stay with you. I don't, now if you cast me away, no, where, where do I go? I'm not only Hathapati. And he refuses and he kicks her out. And then she goes, she, she cries, she tears her garments. She tears her garments. She's probably definitely not in a, in a, in a, in a, in a state of modesty. And but the same effort, she puts ashes. She doesn't cover her hair with an ma'aporet. But this is what the Midrash argues. That Tamar, even at that moment of, uh, of uh, deep tragedy, still has the mindset of covering her hair uh, as to be, uh, not to be immodest. So there's a problem with this, with this Midrash. Um, in Midbar Rabbah, that's the Midrash Agada that uh, comments on the same basuk. And I just, I, I put it here, as I said, it's a later Midrash, but I want to show you how uh, we have a proof in the text that it's later. It, it's, it is a later Midrash. Ufara, Lama, why does he have to be Porea, her hair? Shederech benot Israel. let me share the screen one second. Shederech b'nei Yisrael, liot roshan mechuse. V'lechach haya Porea rosha, v'omer la, and therefore he would... Uh, uncovered. Now he takes the word uh, cover, uh, parua to be uncovered. Vomer la at parashed midrach benot Yisrael shedarkan liot mechusot rashein that usually cover their hair. Vealach bedarchei haovde kuchavim shehen mealchot rashein porot harelach masher azit and you walk in the path of the pagans who walk with their hair uh, uh, parua. 
here you got what you wanted. What, what is the problem with this Midrash? The, the, the problem is that the Hebrew is incorrect. If you know the, the Hebrew of the Midrash, the Midrash not always uses Hebrew, it uses Greek and Latin, no, but it uses poetic language and is, uh, it has its flow. This is, um, it, lacks, it lacks the touch of the Midrash. Um, it is, it is uh, cumbersome. Uh, and the word sh- uh, doesn't work with the, with the grammar. Darkan liyot mechusot rashehem, no, darkan lechasot rosham. O, darkan sherashehen mechusim. It doesn't work with the, with the gender, it doesn't work with the grammar. Uh, also, bedachea ovdei kochavim, shehen mealchot, ovdei kochavim are not mealchot, should be mealchim, rashehen pu'ot, should be rashehen pu'im. This is a clear indication that, that that is in general when we approach Midrash, especially Midrash Agada, is, or I mean rabbinical literature in general, is when we see elegant Hebrew, it's Mishnah, then elegant Aramaic is Talmud. Uh, an attempt at elegant Hebrew that is not, the Hebrew is sort of like shaky, that's later Midrash. Sometimes from the Kionic period, that's like Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, and Midrash Ben Midbar Rabbah, and other Midrashim. And then, when there's an attempt at Aramaic that is not so elegant, that is a much later period. So it comes in cycles. So part of it is the Kionic period, and, uh, and some of the Rishonim who wrote in Aramaic, and uh, later on the Zohar. This, this, would be, this would be anywhere between the 9th and, and, and 12th century, and that is already from a period where women, uh, Jewish women, cover their hair either because they live among uh, Muslim women or Arab women or because they live among Christian women. And actually, we'll see later on, when you move further in time to the 14th century, it was sort of the opposite of what we think is the norm, where women, under the rule of Christianity, covered their hair, and no Christian women as well. And women in the Muslim world did not. And there was a the the clash between the two cultures happened with the the first exile from Spain, Maharam al Ashkar, who went from Spain to Algeria in the thirteen hundreds, the end of the thirteen hundreds, he he says all of a sudden the women of Tlemcen of Algeria do not cover their hair and the women of Spain do. So what do we do now? This is a period that's the way Right. Saying. What we see here is a an attempt of yeah. an author yeah. of the ninth or tenth century of trying to work his reality into the yeah, ancient yeah. text. Yeah. What on earth is the Harelach Mashiach Ratzita? I mean, I yeah. know what it means. But like Midah Keneged Midah. Yeah. So uh, 634, yeah. Midah Keneged Midah. It's the kind of Midah Keneged Midah, but. It's it's very vernacular. There you go. It's weird. Uh, yeah. You get you got what you wanted. Yeah. Um, so now we get to another another midrash that I think is uh, uh, I don't know if it's uh, oh it's not translated here. So I'll go to the Hebrew. Uh, I'll share the Hebrew with everyone. One second. Here. Um, so. It's interesting because this Midrash is also uh, quoted by Rashi in, in his commentary on the Torah, and uh, uh, it, everybody uses it to say, you see how important it is for a woman, for a woman to be modest. Uh, so this is in Bemidbar Rabbah also, but probably built on, on an earlier source, maybe even unknowingly, maybe, the, maybe whoever included him in Bemidbar Rabbah didn't know that it's actually a rebuke against people who think that modesty is the end all. Um, and that is about uh, the, the rebels the, of Korah. It's on, uh, it's source number 2, 2.3. 3 is this. Um, there were three people who rebelled, who led the rebellion against Moshe uh, with Korah. Were that, besides Korah, there were Datan Aviram, Ve'on Ben Pelet. And then later on, we find Korah with the Tanva Aviram, but the third, that third person, On Ben Pelet, disappears. Where is he? Amar Rav, On Ben Pelet, Ishto Hitzilatu. On Ben Pelet was saved by his wife. Amrale, Malach Bahadeh Pelugte. 
By the way, uh, it seems to me that from the, the only thing that Rav said were those five words. On ben pelet ishto itzilato, his wife saved him. He didn't elaborate on that. The Amrale is uh, an addition of later uh, authors in the Gemara. Amrale malach bahadei pelugte. Be, the, I'm saying that because if you know the, the statements of Rav throughout Talmud, he usually does not speak in Aramaic, and not in this kind of Aramaic, but we'll, we'll, we'll stick with that. So his wife told him, why would you put yourself into this dispute? Why do you want to get involved in this dispute? So whoever is going to end up as the high priest, you are going to be a follower. You're always going to be second or third in command. So what, what, what's in it for you? You're not going to get anything. She says to him, I know that everybody is holy. They're all such religious people. And she quotes the Pasuk. So because they're all holy, I have a way to save you. What did she do? She got him drunk and she put him to sleep. This is a pattern we find with the with that is biblical stories with the Ael with the uh, with the and then the Yehudit. So they're using a, a, a motif that we already find other places. So she and her daughter sat at the door of the tent and undid their hair. First of all, it's to prove, by the way, that. Immodesty is undone or unkempt hair and not uncovered. But what happened since when she, when, once she did that? Kol man de'ata bishvil on ba'ala kevan de'chaziye hadu. Everyone who came to pick up on to say, "Come join the meeting against Moshe," and he saw the the woman and her daughter, On's wife and his daughter, sitting there with their hair undone. They went back. Between, meanwhile, uh, they were sw- they were swallowed by uh, by the earth. Um, the clearly not the language of Rav. It's a much much later Aramaic. But what is the message of this story? So, like I said, ironically, people took the message of the story as it's important to cover your hair because you see the man didn't come near her when her hair was uncovered. It's exactly. The opposite. Why? The, the, the wife of On says, I know that they're so holy, so they won't come near me if my hair is undone. <laughs> Meanwhile, those holy people, what are they trying to do? They're trying to unseat Moshe. And Moshe is a prophet. And according to the Torah, the whole community was part of the prophecy. <laughs> Right? They, they, uh, this is what God said. I am going to talk to you from the cloud, and it's not Microsoft's cloud, it's a, it's a, it's a different so I'm going to talk to you from the cloud so the people will hear when I talk to you and they will believe in you forever. And that means that Hashem, sorry, the, the, the voice of the prophecy is not heard by anyone except for the prophet. But at that moment, God opens the channels of prophecy sort of for everyone. So they have a real experience. They, they feel and they know that Moshe is a prophet. So for them to come and say, uh, you, are, uh, you are taking, uh, you're, uh, you're corrupt, or you're, you're giving positions to your relatives, or whatever you do, to say that it's not just a rebellion against Moshe, it's a rebellion against God. But those same people, according to the Midrash, turn away from a woman whose hair is undone. What does it mean? That they are hypocrites. And just like we saw in other, with other sources in Tanakh, that dressing with modesty sometimes could be a sign of hypocrisy. This is exactly what the Midrash wants to say. Here we have those ultra-religious people who would not get near a woman whose hair is undone, but they go from there to undermine Moshe and to question God. So the, 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 the end message of this Midrash is 
uh, don't trust, don't trust what you see. Don't trust the people who tr- who pretend to be uh, uh, religious. But from that, so that is with the midrash, okay? midrash Agada. There's more in midrash Agada. I didn't bring all of that. There's a famous story with, with Kamhit uh, that I will just uh, mention like orally because I didn't put the source here. The story with Kamhit was that she had seven of her children. Some say two, but seven of her children. But there are two versions to the story. Seven looks a little bit, uh, you yeah. know, far-fetched. It's a round number. It's a nice number. It's a, it's a mythical number. Uh, some say that two of her children served as high priests, as Kohen Gadol, which is a great achievement. And the rabbis came and asked her, what is your secret? Tell us, how does, how does one get, like the mother of the Kohen Gadol, to have two children serve as Kohen Gadol? And she says, Mi'amai lo ra'u korot beti kil'ai sa'ari. He says, I never did something to my hair in my house. And we'll see, what did she do? So here is interesting divergence. In the Talmud Yerushalmi, there's no reaction to that. In the Talmud Babli, they say, That's not the reason. Many other women did that and it didn't work. Meaning, even if she considered it to be a sign of modesty, the answer of the rabbis, again, it's systematic, was, at least at that point, that's not the reason. Because that is something that you can take upon yourself. It doesn't show real modesty. But what did she say? She said, Lo ra'u korot beti, the beams or the, the, the ceiling of my house, never saw the kal'ay of my hair. <coughs> so, those who think that a woman must cover her hair, understood that as Kim Hedi saying, I never uncovered my hair. But she doesn't say that. She says, my ceiling didn't see my claim. Claim are the parts of the braid, meaning she never undid her hair at home. She never went with hair with loose hair. And that shows that even if you think that there is a requirement to do something to the hair is to keep it uh, bound and not it's not about being covered. Let's take a break here, but uh, let's hear your question first. And then we'll go to the third session of Mishnah and maybe we'll do thir- three sessions tonight uh, and continue some other time. Yeah.